Relationships. Wonderful. Well, today is the last day of our series called Perfect Relationships. So that means by now, y'all should be good, right? Any marriages better six weeks later? Now that we've done any marriages, good one, two, three, four, great, five, six, seven, eight. Nine, ten, great. My parents didn't put up their hand, but that's fine. Uh, anybody else? They're wonderful. Anybody's friendships a little bit better? Anybody feel a little bit less pressure with their friendships? Man, in this series, we've talked about everything. How to be self-aware, how to deal with friendships, how to communicate with one another, expectations that we should put on each other. How many of y'all walked out last week and all your daddy issues have been solved in one Sunday? <laughs> Pastor Harold preached an amazing message on daddy issues, ultimately the father heart of God. It's amazing. And so today I want to finish a series talking about something that I believe that if we can get the revelation of this, it will help any type of relationship that we are in. Today, I want to talk about honor. Everyone say honor. honor. Honor has a, a few different words that can shape and define it. To honor someone simply means to show respect, to value and esteem, to give weight towards or upon or to have reference, reverence for someone or something when you honor them. And already from this simple definition, you can see that just by having honor in relationships, your relationships will be better instantly if you can show respect, if you can value, if you can esteem, if you can give weight to the person, if you can have reverence for them. One verse today that I wanna use as our foundation for this message is 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 17. This is what it says, ready? Honor! Some people, what does it say? Honor, honor everyone, even that annoying person that just came to your head. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. That, that feels like a verse that you would tattoo on your body, wouldn't it? If tattoo were allowed. No, I'm joking, it is, it's okay. Everyone calm down. Old Testament, it's all good. Jesus has a tattoo on his thigh. So, <laughs> Peter, he just drops it. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Peter is writing here, the context of, of who he's writing to in the audience is an early Christian communities in the Roman Empire, and they're suffering persecution for their faith. And these are... Jewish converts to Christianity, Gentile converts to Christianity. And these believers were facing persecution from the Roman authorities as well as a lot of social ostracism and rejection from their non-believing, non-Christian friends and families. And these commands from Peter are intended to inspire the readers and the hearers of these commands to persevere in the face of persecution and to remind them, and this is what's really important, to remind them that their ultimate allegiance is to God. And in this one little verse, Peter gives us a huge spectrum of those that we should honor. And so today, I wanna to look at the three different levels in our life that we need to honor. Honoring those in leadership positions above us, honoring peers beside us, and honoring those that we lead in our lives. So let's start with the first one. Honoring those in leadership positions above us. So this is a biblical concept. And we're to honor people in leadership positions even if they're not Christians. Paul talks in Colossians chapter three about slaves honoring their masters. And I'm sure a lot of the slave owners weren't Christians at the time. But Paul's telling them, hey, they're above you. You need to honor them. Peter, in this verse, 
He writes it plain and simple. Hey, honor the emperor. And this wasn't just any ordinary emperor either. There's a clear and biblical evidence to honor those in positions of leadership. So let's look at a couple of the positions of leadership that we deal with. Uh, let's start with parents. How can I have a healthy relationship with my parents and honor them? Well, the Bible gets into it pretty early on in the story with the commandments. Deuteronomy chapter 5, 16. Honor your father and mother as the Lord God commanded you, that your days may be long and that it may go well with you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Come on, how many of y'all have had parents yell that at you in your face? Huh? Come on. You know the Bible says, right? Right. Well, it wasn't just the Ten Commandments. Jesus affirmed this a couple times when he preached, and Matthew and Paul directly quotes this in Ephesians. What does it mean to honor your parents? Does it mean that you need to be nice to them? Yes. That's a way to honor them. Does it mean to be respectful? Yes. Does it mean that you have to do every single thing that they say? No. Firstly, there are some parents that aren't godly. They don't hold the Bible as their authority. And so if they're trying to, do, trying to get you to do something that forces you to go against God's word, honoring God becomes more important than honoring your parents in that moment. I always get asked this, okay, I'm an adult now. Do I have to obey everything my parents say? Do I, I'm an adult. Do I have to obey? So this is my answer. I want to make it real clear to you. If you live at home, regardless of your age, you may be a 12-year-old that just got out of kids' church and you're now in big church right now, or you may be a 40-year-old that plays video games in your mama's basement. I'm not judging, but there's a reason why you're single, right? So, or you might be anywhere in between that. Listen to me. Listen to me real clearly. If you live at home, you shut your mouth and you do everything they say. But I don't want to do, I'm 30 and they're still making me. Well, if you're 30, move out. Grow up. You get what I'm saying? If you live at home, like I've had people come to me and go, you know, my parents, they make me do this and they don't let me do this. I'm like, how old are you? I'm 28 years old. And I'm like, do they pay for me? Yeah, they pay for my food and the rent. I go, okay, then shut up. Because <laughs> if they going to pay for you, if, if you live in under their house, my dad always used to say this, always, and never, never, never with a nice tone. <laughs> he would always look at me and go, my house, my rules. If you don't like it, get out. Y'all are laughing, but it's weird when I'm five years old and he's saying that to me. <laughs> really, Dad? So if you're living at home and your parents tell you to do something you don't like it, guess what? Shut up and do it. Or grow up and move out. You want that, you want that independence? Then you need to experience the consequence of that independence. And that's okay, it's not a bad consequence, it's just you gotta pay for everything yourself. So how do I honor my, like how do I honor, my parents are here, how do I honor my parents as an adult? I mean, I have my own children now, so how do I honor them? I treat them well, I speak well of my parents, other than that joke I just made, but it wasn't a joke. <laughs> but I speak well of my parents, I've, I've told my parents, I. I have committed to them that I will take care of them into their old age. Not because I'm nice, but because I'm a Christian and the Bible tells me to take care of my parents. But my relationship with my parents now as a 40 year old, and my dad just turned 71 uh, last week, I think, week and a half ago. My mama is about to turn 70 in a couple of months. How does my relationship now as a 40 year old with very old parents, how does that look? Um, <laughs> I have to tell their age because they look so young. You would never know. Ah, ah, flattery. I'll talk about that soon. Uh, 
Right? How, do, how do I honor my parents? How, how does our relationship look? Can I, tell you, can I tell you what it doesn't look like? It doesn't look like it did when I was 12. And if it did, it would be weird and it would be a terrible reflection on their parenting. But they realized when I was 15 that they had to treat me different from when I was 12. And they realized when I was 18 that they had to treat me different from when I was 15. And when I was 20 years old and they kicked me out of their house to help me grow up and to take care of myself, it was a great thing. The best thing my parents ever did was encouraged me to go and move out because I grew up instantly, but our relationship changed. And now I have my own kids. And I gotta tell you, I mean, talking about honoring parents, my parents make it very easy for me to honor them because they know I'm a different church leader than them. They know I'm a different parent from them and they don't try and interfere and to impose, well, you need to do it this way and you need to do it this way and everything. They give guidance, they give love, but you know what they do? They treat me like I'm 40 years old and it makes it very easy to honor my parents. Parents, if you're a parent here, support and love your kid. But remember this, you don't own them. You are a steward of them. Now, here's the other question I get. What if, what if my parent is so terrible that I just can't honor them? Now, I got to be real serious here because I know some of your stories. And I've heard some of the stories of your parents and I've seen some of the stories of your parents. And this is very real. I'm not talking about like, my parents gave me a curfew. Like, get over it. I'm talking about the parents that were abusive. I'm talking about the, the, the drunkards that threw your mom around in front of you. I'm talking about the, the parents that laid hands on you that never should have done it. The parents that let you, you get what I'm saying, right? Like, how do you honor? This is where it gets real tricky because we sit here, we're like, you honor, honor, honor. But then it's like, yeah, but how about my parent? You don't know how much pain they've caused. And this is, this is where it gets real, guys. This is where it gets tough. How do you honor? Well, here's the good news. You don't have to do it by yourself. That's why we have the Holy Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit will come and help us, come and change our hearts. And I heard a very wise man say this years ago, and I've always held on to it. This is it. If you have nothing to honor your parents about at all, at least honor them that they kept you. If that's the only thing you can find to honor your parents, honor them that they gave birth to you and that you are alive. The other thing as I've grown up and gotten a little bit older, I think another incredible way that we can honor the parent that doesn't deserve to be honored. Can we just, can we call it like it is? They don't deserve. That, that drunken parent that hit you, can I just call it like it is? They don't deserve, they don't deserve to be honored at all, at all. They don't deserve. What a wretched human being that would do that. They don't deserve to be honored at all. But you know what? You and I don't deserve to be forgiven. You may not have laid hands on someone. You may not have, in a drunken range, thrown someone around. That's okay. But you and I have both fallen short of the glory of God. And we are all wretched individuals. It doesn't matter on the scale what we've done. We've all done something that has separated us from God. And most of us in this place would love to freely accept the grace and the forgiveness of God. So you know what's a beautiful way to honor the parent that doesn't deserve to be honored? Give them the same forgiveness forgiveness that we've received from God. Doesn't mean you have to be best friends. In fact, with some of those parents, I would say have strong boundaries in place. Forgiveness doesn't mean you forget everything. Forgiveness doesn't mean best friends, but you know what it does? It does more for what's in your heart than it even means for your relationship. It may heal a relationship, it may start restoration, but but ultimately that's all secondary. I want my heart pure when I go to bed at night. God forgives us, so we should honor our parents by forgiving them. You know, the next leadership position that we should honor is government leaders. (laughs) 
why you're all giggling. <laughs> so Peter makes it very clear. What he, like Peter doesn't get into a discussion about it. Literally three words, honor the emperor, right? And so if you know your history, most theologians and historians believe that at the time the emperor was Nero, who was a nut job, crazy, egotistical man known to dislike Christians. Uh, if you've been around our church for a while, you'll know I struggle with the corruption found at every level of government in the Philippines. I struggle with it, as do many people in this room and many people watching online. I hate, I hate seeing the rich get richer as the poor get poorer, not because of good business, but because of corrupt business. I hate it. And Peter's here talking about a man who's basically persecuting Christians, and he says, honor them. This statement is not an endorsement by Peter of the evil or corrupt government officials. What Peter's doing is he's challenging Christians to live with integrity, to respect authority, and to demonstrate good citizenship even in difficult times. Now, I have a dream for the, wow, that's, <laughs> sorry, I didn't mean to say that like that. I have a dream for this nation, uh, I do. I love this, if you're first time in church, uh, I'm the whitest Filipino you ever gonna meet. Uh, I was born in this country, I will die in this country in many decades, hopefully. <laughs> I love this country and I have a dream that at every level of government from the local barangay all the way up to the office of president that we would see integrity begin to infiltrate. And the, and the things that have done in the past would, would go away, right? Just the, the thing, that we'd actually begin to follow the law. The law isn't bad, the law is good. We just need to follow it, right? And we walked a very fine line a couple of years ago. There was this little thing that happened a couple of years in the Philippines uh, called the presidential elections. Does everybody remember that? Just sort of. <laughs> Everybody remember that little thing? Wasn't that a wonderful time of bringing people together? <laughs> Does everyone remember how awesome your family gatherings were? <laughs> Just who are you voting for? Oh, for them, I'm voting for them. Oh, wonderful. That, wasn't it incredible how we all put aside our differences? <laughs> no one got angry at each other. Does anyone remember? Hey, that was a tough time. In our church, in our church, we had Marcos family and Pangalinan family sitting in the same row, right? Like we had to walk a fine line in our church. But can I tell you this? I just want to make this really clear. I am so proud of the general population of our church that even though for some people their uh, presidential candidate won, they were happy. For others, their presidential candidate lost, they weren't happy, but you know what? The weekend that I preached into it right after, is you know what we did? We put the Filipino flag up on the screen. You know, the, the, the red that represented, you know, Manny Pacquiao, and uh, <laughs> should have voted for him. And uh, <laughs> Manny, he would have walked up to the Chinese, hey, right, you know. <laughs> Manny Pacquiao be on the boat in the West Filipino Sea. You want the You want this? Um, I was so proud of our church because I saw some staunch supporters of the other candidates praying for our new presidential candidate. Can I tell you, if you don't like our current presidential candidate, all right, amazing, pray for him. Pray for him, because if he does a bad job, we all suffer as a nation. If he does a good job, we all win as a nation. So Peter's sitting here and he's going, hey, with their governmental leaders, man, the relationship that we have with them, okay, yes, we need to stand up for truth, we need to stand up for righteousness, we, we need to expose corruption and evil, but we also need to honor. So we are gonna honor and we are going to pray for them. And if 
they are really corrupt and you're really frustrated, maybe God has given you that frustration to let you rise up to be a new voice. We will have congressmen, congresswomen, senators sitting in our church now that will run and will get positions. I've been praying since the beginning of this church that we're gonna see a president rise up from within our church to lead this nation at some point. Amen. Another level of leadership above us is honoring our church leaders. Let me say something very, very, very strongly. In our church, we believe that honoring leaders is not something that should be demanded, but something that should be earned. I believe that our leaders should earn the honor and the respect of those they lead by their integrity and the way that they live their lives. But if you're following someone, can I challenge you that if you're a part of this church, I believe that we should have a humble spirit that looks to honor rather than a consumer spirit that's looking to be impressed. The Bible's clear about honoring church leaders. First Thessalonians chapter five, verse 12, Paul writes, dear brothers and sisters, honor those who are your leaders in the Lord's work. They work hard among you and give you spiritual guidance. Show them great respect and wholehearted love because of their work and live peacefully with each other. Does honoring your church leaders and really anyone in a position of leadership, does it mean to blindly follow them? No, not at all. In our church, we actually always give space and we encourage people to ask questions. If you don't understand a decision, if you don't understand a position, if you don't understand a direction, we always encourage people that if you have the right spirit, if you don't have a critiquing, divisive spirit, that you can come and ask any question of why we are doing what we are doing. You can honor and ask a question why. In fact, I wanna encourage you, don't blindly follow anyone. People's leadership, it will be tested and either approved or disapproved over time. You know what a great way is to honor your leaders and how to honor them? Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17, it says this, obey your leaders and submit to them for they're keeping watch over your souls and those who will have to give an account. Ready? Let them do this with joy and not with groaning for that would be of no advantage to you. It, it is so joyful for me to lead people that are honoring. And honoring does not mean that you flatter, does not mean that you grovel, does not mean that you, when I say something, you, yes, sir. No, no, no. Honor is actually not about what you say, but it's your heart and your spirit. We've talked about this with submission. Submission isn't doing what someone tells you to do. It's doing it with agreement in your heart. It's not just about doing yes and being a yes man, not at all. In our church, again, I love the culture that's grown, the, the Paul and Timothy culture of leading, the how to judge without being judgmental, people asking for feedback in our church. I'm, I'm so blessed. I feel so honored when people ask me for feedback and they receive it and they take it. It makes it joyful for me to lead them. No. Whoever we're following, whether it's our bosses, our teachers, our professors, you can apply any of these principles of following leaders in your life. A simple way to honor those people in leadership positions above you is actually by serving them. You know, I get asked so many times, oh, can you be my mentor? Can you please be my mentor? Can you be my mentor? And a lot of times I've learned over the years that as I've tried to get time with people that are further along the journey than me, that are higher in levels of leadership than me, that the, the easiest way for me to get time with them so that they can spend time mentoring me is actually by me serving them. It's actually the easiest way. Sometimes people are just super selfish. Like they expect that you, whoever you are in whatever leadership position you are, you should mentor. It's your honor and your privilege to mentor me. No, 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 no. It's our honor and privilege to be mentored by someone that's ahead of us in the journey. So serve them. Pay for their dinner. Ask them out for coffee. When they're talking, pull out your phone or your notepad and take notes. These are just simple, practical things, but it will grow you as you are able to honor those that are above you. Don't blindly follow them, but honor them and let the Holy Spirit lead and guide you. Amen? Amen. 
I said amen. amen. The second level that we got to look at is how we honor our peers. So Paul tell, uh, Peter sorry, tells us, honor everyone, love the brotherhood, our friends, the people that we do life with. Paul writes this in Romans chapter 12, verse 10. Love one another with brotherly affection. Here we go. Outdo one another in showing honor. So Paul is smart here because he doesn't just tell us to honor each other. He turns it into a challenge and a game. How many of y'all like games? Paul has gamified. He has gamified honoring. Because he's like, don't just honor, but if they honor you, go away, think about it. How can you honor them even more? Come on, who here wants to be a winner, right? No one wants to, who here wants to be a loser, right? Yeah, no one wants to be a loser. Everyone wants to be a winner. Can I encourage you a great aspect of your life to be a winner in? Outdoing the person next to you in how you honor them. How can you honor those in your life? You can honor them by honoring their time. When you have a meeting, you can show up on time. You know the old line, leaders are never on time. They're always five minutes early. So you can show up on time. If you're supposed to meet at four, don't text them at four and say, oh, sorry, stuck in traffic. I'll be another 45 minutes. Let them know ahead of time. Sometimes there is traffic. But honor their time. We had this thing years ago on our worship team that because worship team would always get here early and there's this young guy and he would always try and sneak in. When I was a worship pastor, he would always be late all the time. I would call him and be like, everyone's waiting for him. I'm like, hey, hey, good morning. Are you coming? And he's like, yeah, 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 yeah no, I'm just, I'm around the corner. And I'm like, you're still in bed, right? And so he would try and come sometimes and he would try and sneak into the rehearsal without me seeing him. And all of a sudden I look and he's on, on the bass playing it like this, right? So I figured out, I had a revelation, I figured out this. He was treating me like a teacher. Like as long as he could get by me, then he would be okay. And what he wasn't doing was honoring every other single person on the team's time. There's a single mother with two kids that managed to get her kids up, ready, dressed, sitting on the front row of church at 7 a.m., eating their breakfast while their mom is on stage. And this little 20-year-old lazy butt it is slept in because he was up playing video games last night, right? I don't have anything against video games. I know it's coming out in this sermon. I don't have anything against that. I love video games. So you know what I ended up making him do? Whenever he was late, I made him get on stage, and not to humiliate him, but to show him what he was doing. He had to go and apologize to every single person on the team because when you don't honor someone's time, what you're saying is your time is more important than theirs. And so he would have to go around and say, hey, I'm, I'm sorry that you got here on time and, and I was late. Why? Because I wanted to teach him to honor people's times. You can honor people by showing them appreciation. Tell them what they mean to you. Birthdays in our church, we love birthdays. We started a culture very early on in our church where whenever someone had a birthday, we just go around and we just say, it doesn't matter where you are, someone celebrates, I go, all right, let's go. Let's say one thing. And whether it's three people or 10 people, we go around and we tell the person what we love about them. It's honoring. Now, there's so many things that could annoy us about a person, right? Think about it. Think about the person next to you. Just look at them. There's probably something they're wearing that's annoying you right now. Our nature, our nature, it's easy to be annoyed. You don't have to try to be annoyed with someone, the way they talk, the way they eat. Have you ever eaten with someone? They're, and they're like eating like a horse right in front of you and you're trying to eat and you can just hear them like, right? It's easy to be annoyed. It's harder to show appreciation. You've got to be actively aware. Hey, I need to honor and I need to show appreciation. You know, another great way to honor someone is to listen actively. When you're having a conversation with someone, don't listen to respond. Listen to listen. So many of us, come on. So many of us, we're listening. We're not really listening. We're formulating our reply. And it's not even an argument. 
Like someone starts telling a great story and then in your head you're like, well, I've got a great story too. And you start practicing how you're gonna tell your great story and you just miss the whole story that is in front of you. You miss it, right? Listen, honor them. Uh, Another way, the last one that I wanna share, another way that you can honor people is, this I love this with all my heart, is, is complimenting people. I love this. Whenever I have a guest preacher come to our church, sometimes we'll walk through the mall to go get lunch or dinner or whatever after the service. And the, the, the walk always takes a really long time because uh, so many people are in our church in Galleria walking around. And every time we meet someone, I, I, I really love our church. And I love the people in our church. And it's so easy for me to brag on people in our church. And our walk always takes a long time because I'm stopping with people and I'm like, hey, this is so-and-so, they do this, they do that, they got saved in our church, it's amazing, everything like that. Oh, and I'm introducing, and it just makes it so easy. It's not flattery. See, there's a difference between being genuine and flattery. Flattery is you're just saying something nice to puff up their ego, but some of you don't even believe what you're saying. You know? Like, I meet tons of older women in our church. You know, they have a birthday. I'm like, oh, my God, is it your 32nd birthday? And they're like, oh, Pastor. (laughs) It's my 60 (laughs) bit. Right? I know she's not 32. It's flattery. But flattery doesn't build your soul. It doesn't build you up. But giving great compliments actually builds you up. I was thinking about this, right? Oh my God, he's getting off the stage. What's he gonna do? <laughs> I was thinking about this, right? So we have so many great people. Like I could walk through this whole church and just talk about everyone amazing. And I haven't planned this. Here's my barber. This is Tress. Tress, stand up. No, no, just wait, 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 wait. No, stand, stand. I'll come down. Angle from behind. Angle from behind. I'm behind. No, 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 don't look. Angle. <laughs> From behind, from behind. Director, from behind. Awesome. Switch the camera to from behind. There we go. (laughs) Twins. Twins, huh? The ba? Twins. This is Tress. So it's easy for me to honor Tress. Tress is a wonderful father in our church, and Tress would be hating this right now. But I met Tress in Bruno's Barber about, uh, how long, six years ago? Six years ago. And uh, and he ended up coming to church at Shangri-La for a couple services. Only understands about 40% of every one of my sermons. Deba? Yeah. See, I try and make it Taglish for you. Yeah, I Uh, understand. You understand. I was thinking that. So so Tress, and this is his lovely wife right here as well. So Tress... Tress, it's easy to love Tress. Like, Tress is an unbelievable father. His kids all serve in the house. They moved from far north in Quezon City to come to Mandaluyong so that their kids, it would be easier for their kids to go to youth group and for them to serve. Tress serves in our, in our grow, grow. He's on our host team. He's in our favor care. Tress trekked up into the the mountains and gave haircuts for everyone. Uh, Tress goes to the jail as well. Sometimes he's, you know, ex, ex. No, he's not, he's not. He never went to jail. Did you, did you go to jail? No, well, I I don't know. But I wanna honor you as a, I know you hate this. I want to honor you as a father in our house that your kids today are serving wherever they are. They'll be serving somewhere. I want to honor you for always showing up. And listen, I I made a joke of it, but a a lot of my sermon actually, because some of the words I use and everything, he, he goes home and as a family, they actually discuss my sermon every afternoon to just fill in a few of the maybe different words that I didn't understand or different things like that and actually go through. He's a man of God, and he's lived a hell of a life. 
You have a great testimony, but I want to honor you. It's easy to honor you, Tress, because of the joy you bring and the spirit of humility that you bring. And so I want to honor you, my brother. Thank you. Love you. It's, no, it's you. If it was him, you would give me much better haircuts, but it's you. He gives a, he gives a good haircut. So, hey, it's the, I could spend all day walking through here, all day and telling you stories of incredible different people that are all here. It is so easy to honor yeah, by what you say. So be, can I tell you, be, be generous with your honor to your yeah. peers. Some of us get weird. Some of us get weird because we think that we should only honor those above us. But your friends and your peers, you know how incredible your friendships would be if you actually turned around and honored them for who they are? Hebrews 13, verse 18, it says, pray for us, for we are sure that we have clear conscience, desiring to act honorably in all things. I want to act honorably in all things when it comes to my friendships, when my peer levels. The last level that we got to honor well is we have to honor those that we lead. You can take everything I've said about honoring those above you and honoring those beside you, and you can apply it to honoring those that you lead. You know, people generally find it easier to honor those in leadership positions above them because there's generally an, a, a reward attached to it. Think of it. If I honor my boss well, I could get a pay rise or I could get a promotion. If I honor my parents, I mean, uh, honoring your parents is the first commandment that actually comes with a blessing. If I honor my parents well, the Bible tells me I'm gonna live long. It's easier to honor someone above you because there's a reward, but... Honoring those that we lead, what's the reward in that? Well, in our church, we, we feel like there's a great reward. This is something we value highly because the church is not an organization. The church is people. And God has called us to shepherd his sheep and to care for his people. So whether you lead people in church or whether you lead people in your office space or in sports or in social dynamics, whatever it is, students that you teach or children that you are raising, God has called us to honor each and every one of them. And I just want to speak into a moment into the, the, the class society of the Philippines. Like, we're so class-driven, we've literally labeled classes. Like, there are malls that are class A, class B. There are whole classes, and as much as we don't want to admit it, there's a lot of Christians that have bought into the class distinction and think that because they are of a higher class than someone else, that makes them better than someone else. Let's see what Jesus would say about that. Mark chapter 10, verse 42, it says, and Jesus called them to him and he said, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them, but it shall not be so among you. Ready? You wanna be a Christian? Here's what it is. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Welcome again to what we like to call in our church the upside down world of the kingdom of God. The world says if you want to be first, be first. The kingdom of God says if you want to be first, be last. The world says you want to be successful, have many people serving you. The kingdom of God says you want to be successful, serve many people. Jesus is responding the context of this, which you can read another time, but he's responding to James and John, two disciples, arguing about uh, sitting in a place of honor in heaven. They were trying to honor themselves, and Jesus is just calls them out and says, hey, you, you want true honor? 
Don't be like the Gentiles that lord it over them. Don't be like the people that walk in their class distinction and feel like they're better than someone else just because they were born into a family of privilege when someone else wasn't. Don't be a leader that whips their people and yells at them. It hasn't worked in church. It won't work in your workplace. And one day your kids won't come home for Christmas time. Jesus says, you want to be a great leader? Serve. Honor those you lead by serving them. And then he points to himself. He doesn't just say it, but he goes, hey, I'm leading by example. Not only am I serving you right now, and not only will, you know, in, in a few chapters time in the Bible, I'm going to get on my knees and I'm going to wash your feet. The Savior of the world is going to wash the dirty feet of the disciples that have been serving him. Jesus ultimately served us all by dying on the cross. He lived it. The people that we lead are not just there as pawns to be used to accomplish the goal or the vision that you have, or even your children. They're not just there to serve you. To truly honor people that we lead, we must serve them with an honoring spirit. I have clear goals and a clear vision for Favorite Church. And I know very well how I want us to accomplish them. And in order to accomplish the goals and the visions and the dreams that God has put on Kate and I heart to lead this church, we need people to accomplish them. So I've got two choices. Either I can just use you for all you're worth to accomplish this great God-given dream and I can use the excuse of it being a God-given dream just to use you, to abuse you once you're done, just throw you off to the side or I can help you become the best person, the best leader, the best husband, the best wife, the best child that you can be whilst we all go towards accomplishing the vision of this house. The vision will never suffer if we are serving the people. In fact, could I put it to you that the vision will be accomplished even greater when we get the secret sauce. This is the secret sauce of Jesus. Oh, you want to lead? Roll up your sleeves and serve. I'm so proud of our staff. I think our staff exemplify this so well. Every single person on our staff willing to roll up their sleeves and to do anything that's needed. In our church, we don't have class distinctions in our church. We are openly a classless church. Look at me, no class. We're a classless church. If you drive a BMW or if you dragged yourself to church walking today, I could not care a less. When you walk in this room, you are no longer Jew or Gentile. Hey, you are a child of God. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where you can't, it doesn't matter your last name. Listen, this is, this is what matters to me is your heart, your heart. And our staff have, have led by example, our pastors, our leaders have led by example of being people that are willing to get up to serve. Even just a couple weeks ago, we had our family night at the podium and it was the, the biggest family night we've ever had. Uh, we've got our next family night is going to be in August and we're gonna give you the details. And we're actually, we're actually renting larger venues now for family night because we can't fit in Shangri-La because we actually want as many people to come along to get the heart and the culture of our church. So. So it was amazing, our, our staff boys, to save money, because we wanna be good stewards of what God's given us, to save money, our staff boys all um, got up early in the morning, what time, what time, at five on the Wednesday morning, and took everything from Galleria here, took all our production stuff out before the mall opened, and then brought it all over to Podium and left it there, and then in the afternoon, we set it all up, and then at night, everyone had a great family night. We had dirty ice cream there. There was cheesecakes, it was fun. We did this game where we heard one second of the song and we had to pick the song what it was. And I nearly won, uh, but I didn't because they changed the rules on me on the last moment. I'm not bitter, I'm not bitter, I'm not bitter. Right, this great night. 
everybody left, went home, it was awesome. And our staff boys, because we wanted to save a little bit of money that night, they did the egg rest, that, and they didn't finish until 2 a.m. that morning, or 3 a.m. even, by the time that some of them got home. And listen, I'm wow, they're amazing. In fact, I don't want any of you to go and congratulate them at all. They don't need their pride built up whatsoever. When I, I didn't do it that night. I've done it other nights. I didn't do it that night. But when I heard it, I was like, wow, that's great. I'm, now, I don't want them doing that every time because it'll kill them, and that's not the best use of their time. And we have to look, so that's why we're looking at different venues to make it easier. But I was like, oh, that's really cool that our staff boys are setting the exam, especially the younger ones that have, that have not been on staff very long because the older guys have been serving and you know, setting up things for years. But I'm like, oh, that's such just a great example of what it means to serve. That we don't just sit back and go, well, everybody else can. No, they get in, they serve, they, they do it. And our staff set such a great example. Can I tell you, how do you honor people that you lead? Serve them. And if you are sitting here and, and you're reacting right now, well, I, I can't serve them because I'm, I'm the boss. Won't that blur the lines? No, no. Are you kidding me? If you learn how to serve, it doesn't mean you do their job for them. If, if you've hired them to do a job, if they're supposed to do something, serving them doesn't mean you're doing their job for them because it would be pointless to have them. But serving them means you actually care about them. You ask how they're doing. Hey, can I help you? Can I help you get better at your job? I'll come alongside you. I'll help you. I'll raise you up. But then I'm going to release you. I'm going to help you. I'm going to serve you. And I'm going to release you. It means having a spirit of love towards them. It means that you don't just look at them at people as people that can accomplish your goal. Little pawns. They are not pawns on a chessboard. You know what they are? They're the king and the queen of that chessboard. Look, they're not the pawns. The pawns, if you understand chess, my kids are playing chess now. They love it. They're like, Daddy, let's play chess. And I love it because I love playing chess. I used to play chess with my dad um, when he was not tired. <laughs> this is about honor. This sermon's about honor. I'm trying to say it in an honoring way. Uh, when my dad, anyway, my dad and I played chess a few times uh, <laughs> growing up, and I love it. But I'm teaching my kids, I'm teaching my kids to protect, to protect the second row. The first row, you can just get rid of the pawns. It's just a pawn, who cares, but protect your queen, because you're queen, right? Never ever look at the people we lead as pawns. They're kings and queens. That's what they are. You gotta treat them that way. In our church, this is what we live by. Do we get it right all the time? No. When we hear that we didn't get it right, we do something about it. Yeah. If you've heard that we haven't got it right, come and tell us. Yeah. We are open for feedback because yeah. we want to get this right. But we want to love people and we want to serve people. The last thing, it's not the last thing that Peter said, but the last thing I want to pull out of that beautiful verse that Peter said was this, that we must fear God. Yeah. Fear God. And if you haven't been around church long, you may not understand what he's meaning. He's not meaning to be afraid of God. Fear, this type of fear is not a, I'm afraid of something, but it's a reverence and it's this holy awe of God. It's not like, oh God, it's ah, oh, God. God is so wonderful. Oh, he is just so amazing. I love God. I really do. And I'm so grateful to God that he sent Jesus to die on the cross for me. How wonderful is that? That he sent Jesus not to have a whip so that we would serve him. But he actually served us by dying on a cross for us. And Jesus, when he left this earth, he said, hey, wait here. The Holy Spirit's coming. And now, not only do we have this wonderful example of Jesus, but now we have his spirit, the Holy Spirit, now here on earth, and if we accept Jesus into our heart, we now have access to the Holy Spirit that will help us have healthy relationships. What a cheat code. The Holy Spirit is the ultimate cheat code. He can come and help us have a relationship. So you're struggling with your parents? Ah, 
The Holy Spirit can come and help you. You're struggling in your marriage? Ah, the Holy Spirit can come and guide you. You're struggling with your workmates? Ah, the Holy Spirit can come. Oh, it's wonderful. But in order to have the Holy Spirit come and help you, you actually have to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. You know, I made it very clear before that each one of us have been separated from God. We've each been separated from God. Sin is what separated us from God. And sin is all the things that we've thought or that we've done that's outside of how God would want us to live. And when Jesus came to this earth and he said, I've come, I've come, I'm gonna give my life up. What Jesus was saying and what he ultimately did was that he, through his death, was gonna pay the price of our sin. But I love that that's not all Jesus did. Jesus didn't just die on a cross and pay for our sin. But when he rose three days later, which is essentially what we're symbolizing with baptism, going down into death and then rising like Jesus did three days later. When he rose three days later, not only had he paid the price for our sin, but he broke the power that sin has over each one of them. Don't ever think that God is an angry God in heaven looking down at you go, oh, these little minions. No, no, no. God honored you and I so much that he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross that whoever the Bible tells us, whoever, no matter what class you're from, no matter what school you went to, whoever chooses to believe in him will not perish but have eternal life. That is our God. That is our servant Savior Jesus. And maybe today you're here, maybe you're watching online and you don't have a relationship with Jesus. Maybe you've never come to a point where you've acknowledged, I I am separated from God. I need you to come and forgive me of my sins today. Maybe you did this a long time ago, but you walked away. Maybe you've been invited today by a friend or you've come to see a baptism. It's the first time you've been back to church in a while. And you know you don't have a relationship with Jesus. I want to give you a chance to respond. In a moment, we're going to stand, we're going to worship, and I'll pray for everyone's honor and our ability to honor and and really just kind of close off this series with a prayer of blessing. But if you're here and you've never accepted Jesus or you did this a long time ago, but you walked away, I want to give you a chance to respond. Could you just bow your heads, close your eyes? If you're watching, you can do this wherever you're watching from. God sees, that's what matters the most. And if you're saying, James, that's me. I'm, I'm that first person. I've never done this before. Or you're saying, James, I'm that second person. I did this a long time ago, but I walked away. If that's you on the count of three, I want you to lift your hands nice and high because I want to pray for you right where you sit today. One, two, three, all over this room right now. You lift your hands. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I see your hand. Thank you, Jesus. I see your hand here. Wonderful. Both hands. Oh, thank you, Lord. That's beautiful. Up in the back, I see your hand. Two hands in the back. Thank you, Jesus. Up in the very back row, I see your hand. Thank you. Up in the back corner, I see your hand. Anybody else would say yes to Jesus today? If you're watching, you can just put your hand up because God sees it. That's what matters the most. If you lifted your hand, this is what I want you to do. I want you to put your hand on your heart and uh, we're going to pray. And as we pray, there's a beautiful verse written by the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 10 that he says that if you can fit Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. So we're gonna pray a prayer that reflects that. And if you lifted your hand, I want you to really mean these words with everything that you have today. So come on, let's all pray this together. Say, dear Lord Jesus, I come to you right now and I ask you to forgive my sin. I believe that you died on the cross, that you paid the price for my sin, but you did not stay dead. You broke the power of sin. You rose from the grave. And you are victorious. So right now I ask, please come into my life. Be my Lord and Savior. Be my best friend. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, can we give God praise for every person that just lifted their hands? Beautiful. If you're in the room, you lifted your hands. One of our team would have seen you do that. And after the service, in just a moment, they're just going to come and say hi to you. And we'd love to just talk with you and help explain the decision and the prayer that you just prayed and help you with the next steps of what it means to follow Jesus. Uh, If you did it online, please 
click the link in whatever description box of whatever platform you're watching, listening to, and we'd love to connect with you and help you in your journey as well. Amen? Amen. Amen.